Uh, all right, hi everyone. We'll get started now. And if anyone is late, they can just catch up. Uh, so I'll just, my name is Liam. I'll just do a quick introduction before we get going with the presentations. And thank you for attending um, this virtual mini conference today. Uh, before the lockdown started, it was one of our goals for the spring to hold an in-person conference uh, with some of our collaborators to talk about their projects and work with Layers of London. Um, but we hadn't got too far along in the organization of that event. So luckily it was easy enough to visit it online, uh, like we're doing with all of our activities. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to hear from four very exciting projects that Layers of London have been working with over the past few years. Uh, first, just to introduce Layers of London. I'm sure many of you are already familiar, but if not, um, we are a project funded by the National, Lot National Heritage Lottery Fund and based at the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London. Uh, we run the website, layersoflondon.org, um, where anyone can view our collection of his hundreds of historic maps. And also anyone can add to and browse our collection of thousands of uh, crowdsourced histories and stories and photographs. Uh, so a lot of these histories are added by members of the public working independently, uh, but many are also added by uh, projects like the ones we'll hear from today uh, that work on diverse areas of London's history. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the website, uh, make sure you go have a look and, and explore uh, after this is all over. Um, it will definitely kill an hour or two off your afternoon. Uh, so just a brief introduction of the panelists today. Uh, we're going to hear from Lisa from the Museum of Youth Culture, um, who works to collect photos, ephemera and stories of the history of Britain's youth culture. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Amy from Newington Green Meeting House, uh, where she is developing a new exhibition space on the radical history of the area around Newington Green and its links to Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, then we'll hear from Fran, who works with the digitization project at the Courtauld Institute of Art, and who's currently running a volunteering project digitizing and preserving images from the Conway Library. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Susanna, Lucy, and Judy from the Architecture Education uh, charity Our Hut, who are currently working to document London's ventilation shafts, which prevent the city's subterranean inf infrastructure uh, from exploding, I suppose. Um, so we'll hear from each of these projects and they'll tell us a bit about how they're adjusting to the new reality of being locked down. Uh, and just to explain how the format will work, uh, we'll have the presentations, which will be about around 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end uh, so please save your questions until then. Um, you can ask questions by typing it in the chat box, or if you want to speak, uh, you can use the raise your hand function, uh, which I think is on the bottom left of your screen. Uh, it's somewhere on the screen. We'll figure out that out before the Q&A session. Uh, and then I'll enable your microphone and then you can just ask your question. And for the rest of the time, uh, your microphones and cameras will be switched off. Um, so hopefully that's everything and we'll get started uh, with Lisa from the Museum of Youth Culture. If you can, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing your screen. Hello, hi Liam, thank you so much for the introduction. Hello everyone, um, I'm from the Museum of Youth Culture. So I'm just gonna be giving a little bit of an introduction to the work that we're doing, where we've come from, where we're at now, and then talk a little bit about how we've been approaching our public engagement with the current lockdown. Um, let me share my screen with you. There we go. Um, so just a little bit of history about who we are. Um, the Museum of Youth Culture is formed from the collections of Youth Club Archive, which is a non-profit heritage lottery funded collection of uh, over 100,000 photographs, but also ephemera objects and oral histories that document uh, British youth culture movements in some way. Uh, so the collection goes back from the 19, um, 1910s now actually to the present day, looking at the different experiences of being young and, and our experience of growing up. So whether that is um, subculture movements, uh, but more generally those kind of formative years of being young and being a teenager. Um, the collection was started in 1997, um, originally as a um, commercial image library. And um, it was founded because our, our director, John, realized 
that no one was trying to collect the story of growing up in those experiences of youth culture and and he thought that you know it was a, a, an area that was at risk of being lost uh, and the collection since then has grown to over 400 photographers and in 2015 um, we kind of had this amazing archive and we we're deciding what are we actually going to do with it um, you know we love the story we love the photographs but it's not being told as effectively as we want it to be and that's kind of where our mission came from to become a museum of youth culture and to, and to move towards that status so at the heart of the collection are these filing cabinets that we've got here there's about six of them that are filled with slides um, when we started as a library in 1997 it was a analog collection and whenever a photographer joined the collection, um, we would duplicate their archives and it was kind of categorized in here by different movements, um, different decades. And this has kind of been the heart of the collection for the last 30 odd years. And um, we work with about 200 photographers in this collection. Uh, you can see here, you know, you've got your more kind of typical areas like jungle and drum and bass, but it goes anything from, you know, kids hanging out on the streets to nights out and uh, different locations as well but as we were developing this this idea of a museum we've been working a lot with this um, collection of slides we were thinking and looking at the narrative that we have and thinking well how can we make the archive more representative you know we're going to build a museum um, you know that's the end goal we say we're going to open our first physical space by 2023 but as we move from an archive to a museum we want to make sure that the collection and the story that we're telling is that as representative as po possible, that it really is a people's museum that has stories from across the UK. So last year, for the first time, we asked people to submit their own photographs of growing up. Um, when we were a bit more of a traditional archive, it was incredibly difficult to take on, you know, that one image that someone would show us at an event. Uh, but those images are just as important as the photographers that we have in our collections. So last year we um, started our first kind of targeted public outreach campaign and said to people, you know, if you've got that one photograph of yourself as a teenager, of your parents as a teenager, or, um, you know, that ticket stub of a gig you went to 30 years ago, or even just an amazing story to tell, we want that to become part of the collection. We almost see the, the archive that we've got as a bit of a... Um, a timeline and a skeleton but it's really going to be people's personal stories of growing up that are going to tell that history of, of youth experience in in Britain over the last 100 years um, so after an initial kind of quite low-key collection campaign and, and the success that brought and just the amazing stories we got for that at the end of last year we launched grown up in Britain um, which is all about going to places across the UK and reaching out to people and having these targeted collection projects um, to kind of uncover untold stories. Uh, at the end of last year, we started our pilot project with the support of the ACE, uh, the Arts Council, which was in Clacton. And it was, we had to kind of think, okay, we need someone that's close enough from where we are to kind of test out which ways of public outreach work best. Um, but we also wanted somewhere that has this amazing history and heritage that we don't think is being represented. Um, one thing that maybe not as many people know is that Clacton was the first place where you had the mods versus rock road battles in 1964. And it was the publicity around those battles that then created Hastings and Brightings that are now so infamous in our memory. Um, it had Butlands, it was this great seaside resort, so there were constantly people coming and going and there was a real exchange of ideas going on in Clacton. Um, so we thought, you know, this is actually a really great place to go to and, and kind of speak to people and actually find out what their experiences were of growing up. Now the Grown Up in Britain project has kind of three ways of collecting. Um, the, the biggest part is kind of this more wider public outreach and, and scanning events. And that's really about bringing people together to share their memories of growing up to share their photographs with friends, with strangers um, across generations and to start collecting that way. Um, we also wanna make sure that it's representative across generations. So we also run youth workshops with young people today to give them the tools to document um, their life and their story. And then we uh, run sessions in care homes, friendship ca cafes and dementia cafes that use what's collected, um, the archive mu and music 
as a starting point to have discussions around growing up and, and experiences of being young. Um, so really, as a whole, the project's about bringing people together. Um, everything that gets collected is then shown locally. So we had an exhibition in the shop front uh, in Clacton High Street, and everything also gets donated to the local history archive um, that, and hope that they continue their collection drive around youth culture. Um, so just a little bit of an insight in Clacton in numbers. So we were there for about three months. Um, we had three, uh, four scanning socials. We did five, uh, nine sessions in um, care homes. Uh, but over the course of the project, we collected 600 photographs and 37 oral histories, uh, worked with over 3,000 people and had a press reach of over 1 million. And, um, you know, we were just blown away by the response we got from people, the message that we got, the story that we were able to collect. Um, but also more generally that wider reach of how interested people were in hearing about uh, a different narrative around a town like Clacton. So anyways, for 2021, 2020 and 2021, we had this great big plan of going across the UK to do similar projects. Um, we actually, in February, started a project in Thamesmead and also in Brent as part of Brent 2020. So we had lots going on, um, but then the lockdown happened and we really had to think, okay, well, well what are we going to do? Um, we, we don't want to lose the momentum of what we uh, started with the exhibition launch last year and with um, the Grown Up in Clacton project. Um, but um, our, our entire project was about bringing people together to share those experiences. And we, and we realized those experiences are incredibly powerful uh, and we're collecting a story that's incredibly important. Um, and we definitely think that there were ways that we could um continue this work continue this project but in a way that we do it where it's remote um, so the first thing that we kind of focused on was our online platform where you can see our archive and where you can see our collections and we started to develop at home activities um, when you think about it really everyone's at home um, stuck at home and it's the perfect time to get out your old photographs those old family albums um, even just to pick up the phone and speak to one of your family members about their experience of being young or reminiscing about those um, great times. And um, we kind of wanted to use that as a starting point to uh, get people to start talking about growing up and to connect people across the UK through this shared experience um, of being young. So um, we developed this at-home activity pack that's just kind of gives you tips and potential discussion points on how to get started. Uh, it also gives you advice on how you can digitize your photographs or how to um, uh, record oral histories at home. Um, it gives little packs on whether you wanna, whether you're at home with your family or you're isolating by yourself, you know, how you can connect with other people through that process. And we've been working with uh, Time Out and other media partners and more generally kind of our partners on the project to try and get this message out there and say, you know, look, now is the right time to go through those photographs to connect to people uh, and bring people together, but also to help us tell that story uh, of growing up. Um, so these are just some of the pages from the at home pack. Um, I think the totes document is about 20 or 30 pages long, um, but it's got uh, photographs that we've already had submitted and, and some of the different areas and stories where people have um, shared memories. Um, We've got little starting points for discussions to get you going. Uh, you know, anything from describing your teenage bedroom to, you know, leaving the family home, what that was like, what your first job was. It has some tips on getting started, you know, if you're not really sure. Um, and also how to digitize your collections if you don't have uh, the tools that you might think you need at home. You know, it's, it's really easy to do some DIY archiving at home. And, and this is really trying to encourage that. And then profiles of people that have already submitted in the past. So again, just to get, get you going and, and, and start thinking about your experiences of growing up and what that was like. And so far the response has been really good from us. We've really, we've really seen that there's a real power in bringing people together, but also uh, people are really eager to have those experiences of, um, of sharing memories, you know, even a couple of weeks ago, trending on Twitter was um, me at 20 hashtag and literally tens of thousands of people were sending in photographs of themselves of, of being 20. So there's, I think there's a real need for people 
to want to look back at past times and reminisce about those times and share those memories and experiences. Um, so we, we developed this online site and we were like, this is really great. Um, but the people that we found have benefited the most from the Grown Up in Britain, Britain project work that we were doing. Uh, and the people that are also most affected by coronavirus are those that are uh, over 70s, that are self-isolating, potentially self-isolating at home, uh, and are potentially going to be in lockdown for a much longer period than we are going to be. We also realized that developing these online strategies and tools is maybe, you know, it, it won't be as accessible for them. So we had to think about uh, offline tools and strategies that we could have alongside the um, the digital campaign to support these people. Um, so we developed several um, things. Well, we're in we're in the process of developing several different areas. Um, one is a free phone number, so kind of a youth culture hotline where people can ring in and and have a chat and share their experiences of growing up. Um, we're thinking about doing like a weekly prompt. So, you know, maybe this week we'll be asking about, you know, what is your first job? Tell us about your first job. And next week it's about how, how did you meet your current partner? And um, so we create these uh, kind of little memory banks that we can then share back out to people. Again, it's all about connecting people and bringing out those memories. We understand that some people might not really like to talk on the phone. So we're also sending out postcards with three postage addresses. Again, with the same thing, send us a, send us a letter, send us a card. It's a free postal address, all, all you need to do is just write down a memory and send, send that our way. And then um, the, the longer thing that we're developing, which is going to be coming out um, later um, this year, I think probably towards the end of summer, is, is an in-the-book version of our reminiscing sessions. Um, so we were really amazed when we started working uh, in care homes of the power of using photography and music to spark memory and, and what that can really bring back for people. And um, we decided to sit down and develop a in the box version that's incredibly easy to use that we can share with care homes. Um, we're part of uh, Brent 2020 this year, London Borough of Culture, and we are supposed to be running that project right now to collect those memories. And, and we had these care homes lined up that we're going to do all these workshops with. So we went back to them and said, well, what if we create a box that we can send over to you? So when um, you're past your crisis point, but you're still in lockdown, you've got this box filled with 10 sessions that you can run with your residents that are all around youth culture and memory uh, and use that as a means to support you. So we're currently developing um, this box in collaboration uh, with Brent. 2020 funding and uh, it's it's a mix of pop-up exhibitions that they can put up uh, you know creating your own know, memory wall um, within the care home um, to hands-on activities that are quite fun um, so we've got youth culture bingo where every number relates to uh, a, a year and a fact um, to objects that you can touch and, and, and use as a starting point for discussions um, and kind of at the heart of that is a little tablet that has uh, scanning an oral history recording tool. So they almost create a bit of a memory, collective memory of people's experiences within their, within that care home of growing up. Um, so I think I'm basically at the end of my time now uh, and a lot of information, but I just thought I'd maybe leave it on these questions that we've had, you know, we've, we're developing all these different tools and I think definitely for the future, it's going to make us much more um, agile in, in how we can, uh, run our public collection drive and, and make sure that it's more egalitarian and more democratic. You know, I think that's definitely something that um, that coronavirus has done and enforcing everything online, creating these online and offline tools means that in the future, our Grown Up in Britain project and when we go to towns, um, we're going to be thinking a lot more about how we can reach people and make sure that's accessible and democratic. But from a museum point of view and a museum of youth culture point of view, we, we've definitely had these two questions come up and, and that's you know will new, new youth culture scenes and subcultures emerge from the coronavirus crisis you know what are young people doing now? it must be so incredibly difficult to be a teenager right now and, and is something specific going to come out of that but also the leveling effect that it has on culture through digital platforms and you know in a way removing the need for people to go to places it, it's quite an interesting um, an, an area, you know, it's forced us to think of, well, how can we actually reach people more effectively? 
Um, but it's been interesting to see how other museums and heritage organizations are developing digital tools um, that do in a way make collections more accessible. Um, so I think I'll leave it on that. Um, and shall I pass it back to you, Liam? That's great. Uh, cool. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. That was really interesting. I think um, even just from looking at your slideshow there, we can see that you've already collected uh, some really lovely images. And I think uh, with your these activities that you've developed, I was thinking it'd be good uh, bonding activity for the parents and teenagers that are now spending a lot more time together than they might be used to. Uh, I think it's also really great that you're um, yeah, thinking about how the resource that you have and how you can help people who are finding um, the lockdown uh, even harder than most of us are. Uh, so thanks for that, it was very interesting. And uh, I direct everyone to the Museum of Youth Subculture website where you can see a lot more great uh, images like the ones we saw on that slideshow. Um, so Amy, if you're ready, you are? I think so. We can see you, so that's good. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, uh, can you see that, Liam? Can you let me know? Does that work? Yep. Okay. Uh, lovely. Um, so uh, my name is Amy Todd and I'm the uh, Community and Learning Manager um, for Newington Green Meeting House. Um, and we're running a project um, that's also Heritage Lottery um, funded, which um, runs for three years, runs until um, the end of 2023. And um, there's a few things that the, pro the project will do. Um, one second, my slides don't seem to be working. Um, there's a few things that the project will do, uh, and the, kind of the main basis was um, Newington Green Meeting House, which is London's oldest um, site of non-conformist worship. Um, the Meeting House it kind of sits halfway between Hackney and Islington on the borders, and it's a beautiful old building, obviously very important historically being such an old site of non-conformist worship, but has always had quite an interesting radical history. It's always had people attached to the building, like Mary Wollstonecraft, one of our former ministers, Richard Price, who have always had quite controversial and radical ways of thinking and challenged the establishment, the government um, at the time to try and make the world a kind of equal, fairer place. Um, and that also had a link to the religion because the meeting house has been um, a place where the Unitarian faith has had a home in London. And so um, it's got lots of really interesting people throughout history that tended to uh, have been kind of lost to history a bit because they, their ideas weren't um, okay for the time. For example, Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, she's a kind of the mother of feminism. She had all these very progressive views on women, equality, the abolition of slavery. Um, she had um what at the time was seen as uncontro was seen as controversial sexual relationships so therefore she was written out of history um and the more we learn about our heritage the more we realize that's the case and we've got some really amazing people um attributed to the building and the area the wider newington green area that um this project is all about sharing their stories um, so just a, a bit on that there about the history so um really the message that we're sharing with this project is about dissent um, and dissent being um, ways that you can rationally dissent, that you can disagree with people, that you can um, question things in a rational way because the enlightenment period is a big part of our history so it's all very much about exploring things, questioning things, discussing things um, and here on that slide you can just see a little bit of the, the history of the dissenters which is a big part of our history. Um, but we're not uh, just focused on the history, we also focus on how do you dissent today. Um, the church today, the church building, is used by New Unity, um, which is a non-religious church. Um, we're the only one in the UK. And as a non-religious church, um, they do an awful lot of work um, on similar things to try and make the world a fairer place. So, for example, it was... Um, one of the first places to close marriages um, for all people until same-sex marriage became legal. Um, so in a way we're still dissenters today and that's something that we 
do a lot of work on dissenting in the past and how we can learn from people that dissented in the past and dissent today. So just to say what we would have been doing this summer is um, after an extensive development period, of which I wasn't involved in, I've just been involved in, in the delivery since um, about October last year. After all of that work, um, we would have eventually got to the place where we would have been reopening the Meeting House building because it's been under a lot of, um, they've had really extensive restoration and conservation work. For the first time, the building was going to be fully accessible, which is amazing because that's an important part of our ethos. But unfortunately, having a historical building meant that it wasn't fit um, for purpose for a lot of pe a lot of users, which was um, very sad. So that's amazing that it's um, accessible. There would have been interpretation in the building so the building um, was unfortunately used for events just for events or for the service on a sunday and um, it wasn't really open to the public and so through this funding and this project we were able to open the building up to the public and um, so it's kind of like a, a museum a community space in the week so there would have been signage and an audio tour when visitors came in. They would have been met by volunteers that were kind of at the front of house. Um, and that's obviously not happened. Um, and an awful lot of work went into trying to get the promotion and the marketing and get everything ready. And we were about to get that out to the public press and everything about early mid-March. Uh, and then unfortunately then had to weigh up that's probably not going to happen. And every day was this, shall we put it out? Shall we not? Okay. And then we came to the decision that um, it, it wasn't safe to do that. And we needed to wait. And now we're in a position where, where we hope the meeting house will open in, in October, but we're just kind of, um, we're planning for that and seeing if that changes. Uh, so, like I said, would, the meeting house would have been open this summer. We would have had lots of lovely um, volunteers from Hackney and Islington um, that were helping us um, do our front of house. We would have been open a couple of days a week and we were moving towards four, but we're a new team. It's a new building for us um, and the building itself has had lots of work. For example, it's had a basement with a whole new set of rooms um, being built in there. So in terms of staff getting used to the building and stuff, there was quite a bit of work there. Um, and one of the, the big things that we have been doing that we're still doing in a different way is that we've got, uh, we're very lucky to have a lot of community partners. Um, New Unity, the, the non-religious church, the organisation itself, um, has lots of wonderful community partners with NGOs, the local Turkish and Kurdish community centre, Daimer, um, with Claudia Jones, which is a, a charity that does quite a lot of work for um, black women and domestic violence and um, a lot of family support and things like that. So we have these existing contacts. And so we very much wanted to work with local organisations that are also kind of dissenting today in a, in a modern framework, doing lots of work to help the community and how we can be involved in that. And we've always been very lucky because our mentor um, for, um, from our funders is very much um, aware that the way to engage a local community with heritage isn't just to go forward and say, oh, hello, do you know who Mary Wollstonecraft is? And we're this building, you know, because the amount of people that will engage will be a lot smaller than if you open it up as a community space that's accessible, that is reflective of people's um, different communities, that you, you directly, um, if you can, fulfill a need by a community. So say someone says, we'd love some stay and play sessions because there's nowhere in the local area where I can sit down as a parent and, you know, um, have a cup of tea and my child can meet other children locally. It's more important for us to do that first and then build relationships and work on heritage and history more explicitly, although that can be woven in when you start those relationships. Um, so that's the way that we've always kind of worked. So having a building to do that was really important for us. Um, and uh, like you'll see there, we've been busy cataloging our archives, um, which have been held fairly precariously in different buildings and things. And for the first time due to this um, money and this project was um, put together, catalogued at Hackney, Hackney Archives by a team of fantastic volunteers that have been putting so much effort into this. And we were gonna have a robust system. 
Um, obviously, a lot of those things haven't been able to happen now. So it was looking at what we can do in the short term. Um, and after, once we got over the fact that after all our hard work, we weren't going to be able to open in, in April, um, we postponed the reopening programme that we'd had planned for Easter. Um, and we're planning that currently for October. Our kind of strategy is that we're going to start small and grow bigger. And we're going to plan as if we're opening in October now, but also aware that that might change. And so we're just going to kind of do as much as, as we can and then that can get amended. And in a way, at least none of that work that went into opening at Easter got lost. It's just being moved until autumn. Um, and um, that reopening programme was going to be events and exhibitions and community events and using the venue in all its different capacities as a bit of a showcase to show the community, hey, we're here and look at all these things that we're going to be doing. And, you know, there's something for everyone. Come along and meet us. So we've turned our attention to a, a kind of new remote online summer programme um, and just doing as much as we can do remotely and safely now. Um, one of the brilliant things that has come up because of that is that um, Mini Kardesh, which is a, a local uh, nursery, but they do an awful lot of work with the local Kurdish and Turkish parents in the area. They got in touch to say that they um, have had some parents asking about informal ways that they can practice their English. Um, now, going back to the point that we were saying earlier about um, the way that we work is to engage the community first and then work towards building work around history and heritage or, or linking it in. Um, they mentioned that they would love some kind of, what they're looking for is, is some ways for parents to be able to practice their English. And just, I used to teach ESOL, um, and so we've started up a programme where um, every week we have a session with Turkish and Kurdish parents, and we, um, have uh, themes and the themes are based on uh, the local community so Newington Green one can be based on local history and what used to be in the area before and how that's changed so we're kind of weaving in history and heritage to meet a community need which is a language need um, and like I said we're very reliant on new unity and their contacts and um, previously for this so that's a, a been a great boon for us but obviously we're heavily reliant on the website as well. And so what we've been doing is utilizing this time to do quite a lot of website testing um, to try and get our website as uh, accessible and user-friendly and, and in, in, uh, useful um, for people. Um, and we're planning some online exhibitions and talks and things like that too. But it feels a lot like that's we've only just got there recently. I think the shock of getting over not opening at Easter and then working out everyone's jobs is ch is changing slightly. You know, I'm I'm an engagement person, so I'm used to face to face stuff. Now I'm having to spend a lot of time online and testing out the website and hosting Zoom sessions. And that's a whole new set of skills that we have to learn. So um, doing a lot of that, too. And then it came to kind of what we're planning in the longer term. So this is between now and autumn. Um, so we're planning some things for the summer holidays. Um, we're aware that one of the groups that we've all, uh, you know, since autumn that we haven't really engaged with is, is a kind of young people, say 14 to 21. And so what we're looking to do is a, a program um, based on craftivism which is uh, craft meets activism which we're seeing all the time at the moment with um, you know people putting um, rainbows in windows you know people sewing scrubs for the NHS and things like that how uh, people are using a, a, a craft and art um, to express political sentiment and also dissenting at this time too so we're really interested to kind of um, get on that and what we'll be doing is working with craftivists um, and releasing sessions every six weeks that people can can get involved in um, there and looking to um, get together some resource packs that we can send to people's houses to make sure that we're being accessible. Um, we've got a lot of school resources that um, we were going to be delivering on site um, so we were going to be welcoming schools in Hackney and Islington to the site so that they could learn about the history and we had we have quite um a important poetic heritage a lot of our congregation formerly have been quite 
um, found, uh, fairly well-known poets. Um, and so we were going to base some work on that to meet the needs of the English curriculum. Um, so those resources have had to be amended and gone online and they were released this week. Um, so hopefully um, we can still um, get some engagement with school children that way too. Um, and another thing is that uh, the cataloguing project, um, that um, we were able before Hackney Archives closed um, to, to, to get a decent amount of it catalogued to a high standard. And so now what we're working on is creating an online version of that for our website, just as a sample. Um, there's hundreds of um, items in our archive that we've managed to catalogue. Um, and so we've got a sample of about 20 that's going to go on our website soon so that people can engage digitally with that. Um, and just to finish off, these are some things that, that I think that I thought might be worth sharing. Um, we've been incredibly lucky and it is just luck really and due to the skill of the, the team that work on this project that we have a lot of people that have amazing skills and talents in other things that they don't maybe necessarily get paid for <laughs> and um, because of that there's been a really great flexibility. So for example with me having an ESOL background meant I've been able to to fulfill this need with the with a local community and um, Stephen who's our events person very much it, it's a physical job but he's managed to through perseverance and skill and talent been able to translate a lot of that to online stuff which has really helped with online events and things like that so we're very lucky there I think timing wise it was very sad that we couldn't open in April but as a lot of people will probably understand and appreciate it's easier to, to change things when they're new than when they're well established so I think we were quite lucky timing wise that um, no one was really no one was really aware when we were going to open yet and what time and we hadn't really got the word out to the wider Hackney and Islington um, population what we were going to do so at least in this sense we're not um, we, we can open again in autumn and, and that's not been lost so much um, and that, like I just mentioned kind of briefly I feel like some of these exciting engagement community online events have only just started happening and I think that's okay I felt for a long time that lots of other projects were doing lots of exciting things and, and we weren't and I think it's just taken some time to get our head around things plan a bit longer term than trying to just fill a gap and get lots of things online now um, and think a bit more strategically um, so that's why I put don't rush into action it's okay to have some time this is an unprecedented time um, and just lastly supporting things that are going on you know a lot of our partners that signed up to get funding with us are not going to be able to deliver what they said that they were going to be able to deliver and um, you know we're really grateful that our funders are very flexible with that but they do have different needs now and so um, going to local organisations and partners and saying hey what's going on with you what do you need is there new ways that we can work together and um, that will mutually benefit us um, we found to to be great and a lot of people don't get back to you because they're really busy but i think at the times where they do and you can have that honest conversation it can create some really interesting possibilities um okay i think i'm done now great thank you amy uh, that was very interesting uh I think uh, one of the great things about your project is that since it's a physical space and you've already done so much work on it, that that physical space will still be there uh, after this is all over. So you must work on making it better for uh, when you eventually can open. And I'm sure it'll be a great uh, resource for the local community and uh, Londoners all over the place uh, as well. Uh, also, it's really interesting how you're engaging with the craftivism and uh, thinking about uh, stuff that um, like the spontaneous stuff we see like stuff going up in windows like the rainbows like that is like you see Forbes a descent that you might not register as such just by walking past the window um, but when you frame it in that context uh, you can see the deeper meaning in the tradition uh, that it comes from. Uh, so thanks Amy. Uh, so next person is Fran uh, from the Courtauld Institute of Art uh you're there okay we can see you and can we hear you hello we can great cool perfect take it away 
share my screen. Can everybody see? see my screen yeah <laughs> great um so yeah just thank you so much um to liam and to adam and the loads of london team for organizing this it's really nice to get an opportunity to share uh what we've been doing because we've just been within the project kind of so blown away by how our volunteers have adapted that it's really nice to be able to talk about everything that's been going on um and thank you lisa and amy as well i've been jotting down lots of ideas um, so my name's Fran, I'm the volunteer officer at um, the Courtauld Institute of Art. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the photographic digitization project, tell you a little bit about the history and then tell you some of the things that we've been doing with Layers of London and show you a couple of examples. Um, and then I thought I'd walk us through um, a few of the other things that volunteers have been busy doing um, since lockdown. So most of all, it's just been really great to have Layers of London as another kind of resource that we can use to keep our volunteer community active, um, which helps us to meet our objectives of expanding access to heritage to everyone while enabling volunteers to learn new skills in the process. So um, meet the team. Um, the digitization project started in 2017 and we're due to complete in 2021. Um, we're a small outfit within the larger Courtauld Institute of Arts. We've got three full-time members of staff, three part-time and lots and lots of volunteers. Um, so we are part of a bigger project called Courtauld Connects. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Courtauld has obviously got um, a very famous art gallery home to a number of very important impressionist artworks. Um, and we're also a university. Um, so our teaching spaces, they're being updated as well. So uh, Somerset House, where we're normally based, has been closed for the last sort of year and a half, um, while builders are working on transforming those spaces. So we hope that when we reopen, we'll have lots of space um, for schools, families, and young people, and communities. We're gonna have a new and improved conservation studio that will be more accessible. Um, and of course, what we're doing is digitizing 3.3 million images from our image libraries. And um, over 800 volunteers have helped us since we began in 2017. Um, but in a, obviously, they don't all come at once. Uh, in a typical month, we usually have about 150 volunteers, um, each doing kind of three, three hours every week um, or every fortnight. So we're normally based in the North East Wing of Somerset House. Um, and the Conway Library, um, which is the image library that we work with, um, is a collection of 1.6 million photographs, all arranged into lovely red boxes. There are 9,892 boxes altogether. So the photographs were collected over about a 100 year period, um, starting with Martin Conway, the collection named after him. Um, he was a kind of famous uh, adventurer and, and lord, very rich man who was friends with Samuel Courtauld and his photographs kind of started the collection. So in the first half of the collection, we have architectural photographs and drawings. They're arranged chronologically. Um, and then by time period um, and then by place so that it's kind of you have to know what you're looking for uh, where it was built when it was built in order to go and find it the second half of the collection has photographs of manuscripts sketchbooks sculptures decorative arts um, and various other things coins and medals stained glass and the collection mostly focuses on European art and design um, it kind of reflects the biases in art history study in the last century, um, but we do have a small collection of images from all around the world, um, India, uh, kind of Southeast Asia, um, some from America and South America as well. So normally when volunteers come in, um, they choose from sort of five different tasks. So the first task is to accession um, the items that we have in the collection. Um, so this, what this means is um, going through each box, taking out what's inside. Um, this will usually be um, between 50 and 100 photographs. Um, we put them into a particular order um, and then they need to be numbered by hand with a unique identifier. So volunteers have been doing that. Um, the next step 
um, it's more of a spider diagram than a kind of straight line. So um, items need to be quality checked because everything's done by hand before they then go into the photographic studios where we take pictures of the pictures, which will eventually go on to a shiny new website, which we hope to have very soon. The other two tasks, metadata and attribution, that's all about going through the collection and transforming anything that is handwritten into um, digital type. Um, so you'll look at the um, boxes or you'll look at an image and write down um, the place or any descriptive information. Um, attribution is all about looking for the photographer name. And we know that we've got about 400 photographers and maybe even more that have contributed to the collection. And we do all of this um, using Google Documents. That's where we kind of have our databases. So it's as kind of easy as possible for people to use and it makes uh, sharing very easy. Um, and it's actually coming very handy um, during lockdown that we kind of have everything on our Google Drive. So before the lockdown, this was our progress. Um, we're basically halfway through accessioning everything um, and photography is not far behind. Um, metadata and attribution were slightly further behind that because obviously we had to wait to do those processes so we didn't start them in 2017. Um, and volunteers have been speeding up as well. Um, so in a good week, um, volunteers can accession between 70 or 80 boxes by hand and um, they can take between 7,000 and 9,000 individual photographs um, and do the metadata for about 100 boxes a week. So it's a, it was speeding up just as we uh, got to lockdown. So to show you our photography studio, which is what most people are interested in, um, and this gives you an idea of how we've ended up with the images that we can then share on Layers of London. Um, so this is one of our photography studios. Um, volunteers, so Darren and Marianne are there placing uh, photographs underneath our phase one camera. Um, and that is linked directly to um, the computer on the right, which has got Capture One software. And that crops the image for us. It makes sure that the colors are true to life. Um, and we end up with photographs that look like this. So you'll see when we take our photos um, that we want to capture the whole archival object. So we've got that kind of blackboard around the outside. Um, most of the objects in our collection look just like this. So they're a, a photographic print that has been stuck onto um, a cardboard mount with more or less information. Um, you can see that these pictures of Kew Gardens, they actually have quite a lot of information on them. We have some images where you'll literally just have the name of the building and the accession number and that's it. So our photographic process relies on being in the studio in person, obviously. So we've had to think about how to meet our objectives and keep working with the materials that we've already digitized and which we've got on kind of um, various different huge hard drives um, and cloud storage. So in the last day of the office, um, I sort of scurried in and took a load of photographs um, that had already been digitized um, from our kind of London collections and put them all into a Google Drive so that volunteers would be able to access them. So digitization can sound very technical, but sometimes the simple tools are the best. Um, and once in the Google Drive, I'm able to then send these um, folders off to volunteers so that they can upload them to those of London or use them for other um, projects. So we'd actually um, encouraged volunteers to try Layers of London um, before we went into lockdown because we'd already kind of seen the potential for the platform for sharing our photographs um, but also to help volunteers learn new skills. Um, so many of our volunteers, they're kind of you know, art history nerds, um, love history, love architecture and photography. Um, so we wanted to introduce them to Layers of London because we thought they may enjoy it. Um, of course, eventually we will have our own website for our photographs, um, but that's a little way off. So we thought it was also a nice way to be able to share our collection before our website is ready. Um, so Adam from Layers of London came and gave a great training session in February um, with 18 volunteers. Uh, it, was, it was great. Um, it was very hectic, uh, but I think people kind of got the basics. 
um, it also turned out <laughs> that it was very useful for me to have been at that training session to see what kinds of things um, volunteers found difficult and see what kind of challenges there were. Um, so when planning how to kind of roll out Layers of London as a lockdown activity for our volunteers, um, that was really handy to know. So I thought um, it might be useful to talk about some of the kind of challenges and how we overcame them to make sure that we can carry on doing kind of this amazing work um, while we're on lockdown. So lots of our volunteers um, are not digital natives. Um, and, you know, to be honest, anyone kind of finds a new website a bit difficult to work with for the first time. Um, so we did a few things to kind of anticipate um, any problems. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Layers of London for already having an amazing user guide um, that you can download on the website. So I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I could just adapt that user guide and put in specific um, information about our Courtauld collections. Um, and I had a lovely group of volunteers. I think some of them are in this uh, conference now um, who helped me to test um, the user guide and kind of iron out any creases. So we weren't in a rush to kind of open this up to all volunteers. We really wanted to make sure that it was kind of, you know, usable and that people could, could get on and work it out for themselves. Um, the second challenge is ensuring that the items are correctly attributed when they're uploaded. So we want to make sure um, that um, volunteers are putting down that our images are from the Courtauld. Um, but we also want to make sure that everybody knows that we're releasing the images under Creative Commons and that anyone can do anything they like um, with the photos. So making sure the attribution correct um, is really important to us um, and something that we've been able to do um, with our user guide is sort of using the same language that we use when we're working in person. So our volunteers are very used to talking about attribution. Um, so we can now talk about um, how to attribute on Layers of London. And I think it's really nice to see how skills that we've been um, kind of developing in person at the Courtauld can be transferred to other projects, which is really great. So as you might remember from the queue images, um, quite often we don't have very much detail or information to accompany uh, the pictures. So when I give out um, these pictures digitally to volunteers, um, they quite often need to do a bit of additional research to actually find out, you know, why is this building significant? What is interesting about it? Um, so volunteers have done amazing stuff like bringing in research from across the internet and finding other media from, from YouTube or from different museums to really like add richness to the collection and bring out some of the stories behind the photographs. Obviously at the moment everyone has really varying commitments um, so we wanted to make sure that if people kind of started on making a record um, but then they weren't able to finish it that we were able to come in and finish it for them kind of collaboratively. So a really nice thing about Layers of London is that we can work as a team. So we've got the Courtauld Volunteers team and there's a setting on the record, um, which means that you can make sure that anyone in the team can then go in and make changes to it. So that's been really, really handy. And then for overcoming any kind of technical hitches and general queries, um, we've got a few different support systems that we're using during lockdown to support all of our activities. We've obviously got email as usual. Um, but we've also been using Slack, which is really great platform. Um, it's kind of a, a closed social media sort of forum channel. Um, we did use it before lockdown for volunteers to be able to chat to each other between shifts. Um, but it's really come into its own in the last few weeks. Um, and we've got a dedicated channel for Layers of London. So people have been dropping in interesting things that they found. Um, I love this screenshot that I put in from Lorraine where I gave her, um, uh, what was it called, Dixcott House in Streatham. Um, and she was saying, oh, I've gone past this house for 20 years, never knew that it existed. So it's nice to have these moments of like serendipity to come up. And here's the result. Um, so we've got 18 records so far, which are live, which is fantastic. Um, and 
we've got 23 volunteers um, taking part. So there are some people who um, they're still working on their draft records um, and they're not available to see yet. Um, but 19 so far are being published, 12 I know are definitely being worked on. Um, and we always ask volunteers to log their time with us so that we can kind of keep track of how many hours have gone into the project. Um, and people doing Layers of London have reported 36 hours in the last couple of weeks, which is amazing. Um, to put that into the wider context of the project, um, volunteers have given 929 hours um, since lockdown began, which is just incredible. Um, but we only rolled out Layers of London uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then I wanted to, to show you just a couple of examples um, of some nice records that we've got and kind of um, I was talking about how volunteers have been able to add real richness to the collection. Um, so we've got um, our record for Billingsgate Market, which has got a gorgeous um, picture um, from the Conway. Um, but then what Dora has been able to do is um, find this brilliant film um, on YouTube, British Pathé film of the Billingsgate fish market in action. And I just really love that our photographs are kind of being brought together with these other materials. It's really lovely to see. Something else that another volunteer has done um, is to create a different collection um, of photographs of London by one particular photographer. Um, so Anthony Kirsting, he was um, a, a photographer um, active kind of throughout um, the 20th century really. Had a really long career spanning from the 1940s um, up until the 1990s really amazing stuff um, and we have his whole um, archive of prints um, and digital uh, not digital negatives uh, glass plate negatives and acetate negatives um, and so Rob who is one of our volunteers and he's doing an MA um, at the Institute of Education in Museum Education um, he took some of Kirsting's photographs and has put them onto layers of London um, he did have the intention of doing an in-person a kind of workshop for young people, talking them through um, the digitization process, getting them to think about London heritage. Um, but obviously, um, that's now kind of indefinitely postponed. Um, so what we are trying to think of now is what kind of things can we offer out to people, you know, for homeschooling, or how can we use what we've uploaded onto Layers of London to encourage really anyone who's an art lover um, or a photograph photography lover or history lover to engage. Um, so we think there's a lot of just amazing potential, so many things that people can do with the photographs once they're up there. So I thought um, if I have time, please tell me if I'm going over. Um, I would tell you about some of the other things that we have been doing. So something about our collection um, is that we have um, the photographer names are quite often written or stamped um, onto the collection items. So since 2017, volunteers have been going through one photograph at a time recording these names. Um, now what we're doing is using that list of names as a starting point um, for research. So quite often we don't actually have any other information about these photographers. Um, so we've been giving out names to volunteers. Um, they have been Googling around, seeing what they can find and building up biographies for these people. So eventually we're gonna be starting to move onto Wikipedia and build up um, Wikipedia pages for our photographers. Um, it's been really lovely. There are quite a few um, women photographers who are part of the Conway. Um, uh, who don't have Wikipedia pages um, and it's really nice because we've we've recorded them as sort of uh, Miss Jones and then it, it transpires that since they took that picture they became professors so it'll be really nice to redress the gender balance on Wikipedia with our collection. Um, people have also been transcribing handwriting of Anthony Kirsting and we do this using Slack because it's quite a fast way um, to get people to have a look at the handwriting decipher it and kind of um, give their suggestions. So that's been really fabulous, really fantastic. We are experimenting with Zooniverse for transcriptions. Um, if any of you haven't investigated this website before, it's really great. Um, we're able to upload the photographs that we've already taken and ask people to go through and transcribe the metadata from the photographs. So we're gonna get even more information than we were before. 
um, when we were back in the library because we never used to take metadata at an image level it was only at kind of box and folder levels so this is really going to um, make our future website even more searchable we have always had a project blog and I would urge you to check it out. Um, and something that we're doing now is going back over the blog. We've got about 60 posts and we're asking volunteers to record them. So um, soon we will have audio versions of the blogs. It's resulted in um, people kind of finding different ways to get good audio at home, sitting under a duvet with their phone and um, making recordings. So everyone's been learning new skills. And finally, um, we've been having a lot of fun as well. So every week we choose um, an item from the collection and then we invite volunteers to make responses. I just really loved this one of um, a Henry Moore piece. Um, yeah, fabulous work. Um, we, we, we always make sure the brief is really open. So this is all about kind of opening up our heritage in as many ways as possible. So yeah, if you have any questions, be happy to take them. Please follow us on uh, social media. We always share what we're doing there. Um, and it's a nice way to kind of see what's going on with the project day to day. Thank you. Great, thanks so, thanks so much, Fran. And thank you for getting all your volunteers to add all that great uh, content to Leah's London. Uh, I think really good examples of high quality uh, records on the site and uh, yeah, I liked that example of pairing the image of the Billingsgate uh, with the video, which kind of puts two things together that otherwise were separate and adds like a new depth and richness, I guess, to the historical information there. So thanks. And also, I love all those extra things you're doing. Were you planning on, were all those pre-lockdown ideas or are they <laughs> come up with like now? Um, I think we, we always wanted to kind of make Wikipedia pages, but it was one of those things where we, we thought, well, when are we going to do it? You know, the main priority was taking the pictures. Um, so we've just bought a lot of things forward. It was the same with Zooniverse. We thought we would get everything on the website first and then start using Zooniverse, but we've had to kind of be like, yeah. okay, let's start. <laughs> Not being in the office gives you yeah. space to try new things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and for our final presentation, uh, we have uh, Our Hut, uh, Susanna and Lucy and Judy. I'll hand over to you. Can we hear you? Sorry, yes, I will yeah, just cool. unmute. And have the others unmute? I can't see them. Uh, All right, they're coming. Mm -hmm. But um, my video just says it's unable to start because the host has stopped it. Have you have you unmuted now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is uh whoops. So can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um okay, so well I was going to introduce ourselves a, a little bit generally first and then um, our project that we're doing at the moment um, invent events and mention a few other things so um, we're from our hut and uh, we actually set ourselves up in 2004 and primarily we're an architectural education charity and we aim to inspire people through architecture um, and I think po probably at the beginning, we mainly aim most of our work at schools in school workshops. And I think our first sort of first couple of years, we worked uh, entirely with prim primary schools um, on various projects. And we would do theoretical um, design projects where children would get to design things for particular places perhaps things in their playground that kind of thing and then gradually we've actually become a lot more focused on heritage and our first big uh well biggish project to us was on um, stockwell bus garage and that was a well it was heritage lottery in those days and they fund us funded us to do a project that involved things like um, school projects and then we worked with oral history and the 
bus drivers and people um, working in the garage. And at that time, I think we, we had made our own um, website that had those stories on it. So that was quite a time ago and things have really moved on, fortunately. And we're hopefully embracing some of the, the ways that we can be much more joined up with other people doing similar or projects like such as Lairs of London. Um, so yeah, we at the moment we're doing a couple of different projects, but our main um, focus is the inventive fence project, which we began, I think it was September 2019. Um, that was our first sort of proper um, well, when we actually started working in schools and with Lairs of London. So we were really fortunate to get going properly before the beginning of this year because everything has obviously changed massively, but it gave us enough time to sort of get, get the project underway. Um, so yes, with, with the um, Inventive Vents project, our aim has been to celebrate um, an aspect of the built environment which actually is really not celebrated at all as, as its own entity. Obviously there are some vents that people will know well, for instance the one that's on the screen at the moment, um, which is the part of the Paolozzi event outside the um, Pimlico underground station. And it's actually nothing to do with the underground, it's vents at a uh, car park. So that, that, that's why it's there, but it's a particularly magnificent one. And there have been a lot of vents uh, being built at the moment because as you probably are aware that London has got some massive infrastructure projects going on um, currently. So there's Tideway, um, in particular and Crossrail and recently there have also been a lot of underground um, extensions so that we've got the Northern Line extension um, in south of the river but also the Jubilee Line as well so we, we're looking at all the vents um, that those incorporate so our, our project is really aimed to celebrate that uh, aspect of underground London which is you know growing all the time and really complex and but as such vents haven't been um, particularly identified as a building type and so we thought that it would be interesting to do that so go on to no <laughs> next slide sorry so we're running the um, volunteer digital mapping um, project with Lairs of London as our project partners. We were very fortunate when we were setting up the, the project, we had a meeting with the MOLA and we had been thinking of um, having a particular app designed to put all the, the to get volunteers to um, map vents, but fortunately we came across um, Lairs of London just in the nick of time, and they have done a fantastic job both at training, um, helping us train our volunteers, but also it just made so much sense to be able to join up with other projects and. A, a, on one large digital map. Um, we were really worried about the longevity of doing something as a separate entity through an app. So it made total sense and it's really been a very positive the whole thing. Um, so yeah, the um, key aim really is to to increase awareness of this aspect of the built environment and encourage people in recording and mapping heritage and also inspire people about 
the built environment of London. Um, we have been able to do some of our school projects. Judy will talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but our project aim is to work in four schools. We have so far worked in two. Um, and we've also planned a whole lot of bus tube walking tours and community workshops. We have carried out a couple of things and obviously we're not quite sure how we're going to carry out the rest or when um, that will all unfold. Um, we are planning a pub public exhibition um, that will hopefully be at City Hall but you know we'll wait and see on that and we're definitely doing a couple of publications with the help of our mapping volunteers um, so we're planning a advent calendar and that will be some of the children's work that we've already done and also a gazetteer of ventilation shafts so in terms of our legacy we'll have a layer of vents added to the layer of london map teaching resources and publications so judy do you want to talk about these okay so um as susanna said we we did manage to work in two primary schools we have another one planned which has been postponed to the autumn term so we're hoping we will be able to do that and we have a secondary school and we're waiting to see what we can do about that um, it is possible that we may need to do something online but we're hoping to be able to actually do that in person um, the uh, primary schools we worked in one in Lambeth and one in Southwark were really um, exciting projects and and quite successful and what uh what we did you can see on the right the slide with all the children visiting canada water so we actually partnered with tfl and also with thames tideway we took our other school to um the tideway head office and they were able to see all the earth coming out of the um ventilation shaft and that goes down to the main to the main shaft and all the earth going along the conveyor belt and out to the um, big barges waiting to take them down the river. So um, we we like to engage the children with what's actually happening and they've had a, a an interesting sort of look at underground London through using the ventilation shafts as a sort of portal to what's beneath our feet. Um, then following on from that, we've also had a look at um, the history of underground London and tunnelling and so on. And we've done um, some, some um, timelines and you can see in the bottom right, um, the timeline, the children working on timelines together about that so they've got a sort of overview of underground London and then on the uh, top left we invented a game Ventiquences where we asked the children to do what um, a sort of similar thing to consequences to the drawing game where you draw the first bit and then fold it over. And this was an idea for inspiring ideas for designing their own ventilation shaft, um, which they designed in groups. And uh, you can see the, the boys at the bottom there who've designed their ventilation shaft to go on the oval um, <clears throat> traffic island outside oval tube station. Um, to replace the one that's already there. This, I mean, obviously a hypothetical project, but uh, they got very involved in that, but they got, got some inspiration from doing the drawing game and also from slideshows and so on of actual ventilation shafts that, that we showed them. Um, so the children became very, very well versed in what was needed for a ventilation shaft and also what it might be 
actually ventilating. Um, as well as the uh, projects for the, for the schools, we have got family projects as well, family workshops. And we did do one at Bloomberg with Mola, who came along to take tours of the Bloomberg building um, and, and look under, um, underneath the Bloomberg building at the Temple of Mithras. Um, so the children learnt about how ventilation shafts have really helped in the archaeology of London. And uh, MOLA have partnered with us and they're going to, to host our final resources, our final teaching resources. But because of lockdown, we have produced some uh, home learning resources which have gone on to the molar site now we've launched a um, ventilation shaft challenge which is for families to do at home and then to send us pictures of their designs but also on on the site we have produced some uh, learning resources which come as a result of our uh, of our um, school resources and they're quite easy to follow and will give people you know a sort of project they could do maybe with the children over a week or so depending on how much depth they want to go into so we've we've produced those resources but as amy said you know we're thinking we're not rushing into producing loads of resources we're thinking about how how we might follow up on these resources and and do something a bit more so that's the education part and i'll hand back to susanna now yeah i mean i could just add to that that i think with with making the um education resources relevant to lockdown it has actually often been a question of making instructions very very clear and explicit and and probably simplifying things to a degree that you wouldn't we wouldn't normally have to do um in quite the same way but it was immensely helpful that we'd actually been able to carry out quite a few workshops beforehand it's quite hard i think if you're going in completely yeah. cold so now to the volunteers obviously uh, we were very fortunate that we had already got some volunteers trained up in the autumn um, but we needed to have some more volunteers because we didn't actually have quite enough for our project so instead of having um, the lovely senate house training room we were able to produce an online training session with um, Liam and that went really well and I think we've managed to retain those volunteers which is really interesting i mean we'll see how how it works over the next little bit um some people drop in and drop out that kind of thing because in fact some people are working very very hard <laughs> during lockdown and some people don't have so much to do it's it's kind of it it's really variable as i'm sure you're all aware um now one so we had our online trade training session through zoom i think it was quite early on in the in the lockdown so we weren't very used to using zoom or anything but it, it i think it worked well enough so that was good so we all had to learn very quickly on on how to do things and since then we've also had virtual meetups and we're planning another one next week so at least we can keep communicating with people um, and in some ways, actually, I think this will change what we do in the future because it's such a great way to make, make that contact um, without having to book rooms and all the complications of the real world. But I think, yeah, the way that we interact with volunteers, at least the, the research or digital volunteers that we have, um, it's it's a really positive experience for us. I think we also have volunteers um, in our education projects and I'm not sure how that's going to work in the future um, in terms of COVID because yeah I mean that the, the, 
space quite vulnerable and we'll have to rethink that. And I, I dare say that your projects, the other projects that have, um, uh, that we've met today um, will be having to think along similar lines as well, whether, whether they'll really be able to go into schools in the same way or your parent and family groups, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that we have been doing is a lot more newsletters and updates and trying to link to other relevant projects and sources. We had a lovely volunteer, a new volunteer came to us um, in our last session who is an illustrator and he's doing a sort of lockdown massive illustration of buildings in, in London. It's a sort of invented building and it, people are doing different lockdown activities and we yeah we, we'll be involved in that um but we also were able to send that out to a whole lot of other people so it's it's a great way to connect people i think um or at least people who have access to digital formats. I mean, that's obviously a problem as well, because some of our volunteers uh, struggle um, more than others with using, you know, different tools that that we have. So I don't know, and um, we probably will lose some people through that problem. And I, I think, I mean, uh, Fran at the Courtauld was talking about that and I think that might be even more the case for us. Um, so yeah, so I was just put that little map because that's an, a new map that we found on the internet and I need to send it through to the volunteers today. <laughs> so that's my afternoon. Oops, now, nah. okay, so oh, yes, that's it. So what we were asking the volunteers to do was to create a, a research archive of events. And um, what we're getting people to do is to ch choose an area in which they wanted to locate and research events. That was really broad. Um, and I think the, the, what we decided was because the Lairs of London website is so um, interactive and really good for collect for the collection that actually people will be able to do wherever they wanted and they didn't have to sign up. So in a way that became, we've adapted our project and it's just sort of become much easier to, to carry it out and, and less clunky because the Lairs of London website enables you to do that. Um, and we also have a recording um, template and we've encouraged people to do online research on collecting information. The other thing that um, we have been asking people to do is take photographs, but we have a photographer as well, uh, one of our volunteers who will be taking wonderful photographs of events for the um, exhibition and for publication. So I think, you know, sometimes you, you may want, you know, two, two different levels of, of things going similar. Actual, well, a photograph is a photograph, but obviously there are, there are degrees within that. Um, and using, very, very importantly, we're trying to encourage volunteers to do online research to collect information. And in order to find them during lockdown, people can actually use Google Earth and Street View to locate and map vents and then perhaps actually go and find them when they're on their daily exercise and GPS them and take another photograph of them. Um, I don't know how much this has actually happened, but I think it, you know, a few people are doing that, which is really exciting. So they'll find their vent um, virtually and then go and visit, visit the vent um, or stink pipe or whatever it is um, when they're on their daily exercise. So it's a way of sort of exploring what's out there um, in, in a kind of directed way. 
um, vent specific. So I'm going to show some examples. So here's um, a screenshot. Um, I think there there are there seem to be fewer um, uh, in the collection today. I'm not quite sure why because I thought there were more, and I think also there are a lot stacked up behind. But there are at least sixty vents now mapped on the um, the Layers of London website. So that's great. Um, I'm not going into the live site. I'm just going to show you the next. So here again is our Paolo's event. Um, and the kinds of things that we're interested in are materials, um, the commissioner, whether it's listed, um, a whole lot of information really, if there, if there are any urban myths about it, because um, there probably are some about, you know, what it's connected to is you know is it, is it a secret listening post that kind of thing we would like to have um that available um on the layers of london website just as, as a sort of added extra bit of information um this is the heatherwick vent and that's in P paternoster square there's a really nice link which I hope has gone on to the, the Lairs of London website, I haven't checked, but that um, links, there is a link on, on the Heatherwick um, studio website to how the design was developed for that. So that kind of thing can really enrich the collection that we have. Um, people, there, there's a lot of people out there who are into collecting stink pipes um, and we haven't completely succeeded in tapping into these people but we are making quite a good headway into a stink pipe collection and there are hundreds of these all over London and we're really really hoping that we'll get a lot of them mapped by the end um, and they connect up very beautifully to the Bazalgette map, which I'm hoping is going to become an extra layer on the Layers of London maps. I don't know whether, Liam, that's still on your radar, but I'm just going to remind you now, because I think it's really, really fascinating to, to look at our, be able to look at our streets in that way. And... Oh, here's, here's that modern map of, of a similar thing of sh showing the sewage pipes. Um, and that is it, because I think we're, we're quite, yeah, running out of time, I think. So um, I'm going to hand, ooh, no, sorry. Um, I need to stop my screen share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Susanna. Thank you. Um, Have I stopped screw sh sharing? Yeah, no. Okay, thanks. Uh, so thanks for that. That was great. Um, yeah, before we had started uh, doing the workshops on the events, I have to admit I was skeptical. About <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think, yeah, once uh, we learned a bit about them, and I see them everywhere. Yeah. Is that a ventilation shaft? Is that a ventilation shaft? Yeah. Uh, and just thinking about how important they are uh, to keep the city going. Uh, Absolutely. Key workers and all that. Um, yeah. Yes. It was a versatile um, form of architecture and sculpture, really. Yep. Uh, that's interesting. So, thank you. Um, so that was that'll conclude the presentation uh, part of this, but we have still have some time to do some uh, questions and answers. Um, so I can think I'll ask our participants uh, if you all want to unmute yourself, so we can do a bit of a we'll see how a discussion if that works. Um, so if you have any um, questions for each other or to start off with.
or I was just thinking maybe like um, we found that we always wanted to do webinars um, but we were just doing our day-to-day -day jobs and we're like we'll do that at some point in the future and it was only when we had this lockdown situation happen uh, that we really had to think about what can we do and it's like oh this is actually not hard <laughs> or uh, it's actually very beneficial because we're able to reach different people who might not have been able to come into um, Senate House um, and it's much easier for everyone's scheduling. It also helps that lots of people aren't doing anything at the moment uh, but I just wanted to ask if people um, if there's anything that you started doing in lockdown and it's like oh why didn't I do this before and that you'll definitely continue on with uh, once we get back to normal. Yeah, def definitely. I think the meetups with volunteers on a fairly regular basis, I think it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think generally meetings too, you know, like uh, the way that we work a lot is meeting a lot of community organisations and partners and people doing projects and my doorbell's going to ring. Uh, Oh, safe. No. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's very time consuming. It's well worth doing, but it's very time consuming, especially if you have to travel. So actually what this does is takes the pressure off that and it, it frees up a bit more time and it just it, it seems more it, it's in it's more informal so um you know just discussing it even if you don't come up with an interesting plan or you realize that you're um it's not aligned what you do is okay you know and so i think it's been really great for creating kind of networks that way too i think for us with the public outreach and, and trying to um you know do these targeted collection drives that was always going to be a limit to that um, you know, we're trying to build a picture of what it's like growing up across the UK, but, you know, we're going to be limited to where we go. So I think developing more both online and offline tools, things that we can send out, different ways that we can connect with people will make the project much more representative. And I think actually, you know, it can break down a lot of barriers for people that maybe can't go to spaces or can't go to events. Um, so I think it can be really beneficial to, in terms of making uh, the work of heritage museums organizations more egalitarian. Uh, so if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question, uh, you can feel free to type it in the box, uh, chat box or the Q&A box and we'll get to that. Or if you want to speak, uh, you can press the raise your hand button and I'll uh, unmute you while you ask your question. Uh, but just to start, I think there's already been a question through for you, Lisa. As someone, mm -hmm. Elise said, wonderful collection, fantastic projects, and absolutely amazing shift in response to the current crisis. How do you address diversity? Do you notice that you have gaps in the narratives you receive with your various types of outreach, say immigrant childhood experience, POC communities, etc.? And how have you addressed that in the past? And how do you plan to address that in our current situation? Yeah, a hundred percent. So um, part of the Grown Up in Britain project came from the fact that we've got gaps in the archive. We kind of went okay we're building a museum let's see what our story looks like when we lay it all out and um the collection goes from london outwards it's definitely very much city based at the moment still um and uh 80s and 90s were a real stronghold so there, we realized pretty quickly there there are a lot of gaps and as well as getting more bigger photographer collections and working with heritage organizations we realized that actually asking people to directly submit and kind of say well you know, what's your story? What are we missing? Could be really powerful. Having said that, mo I, I still think there's a, 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 again, you get those issues of digital literacy. Also, you know, you're, you're again, limited by your outreach of where you're going and who you're connecting with. Um, so we, I didn't talk about it in my presentation, but um, we, we were quite lucky in that uh, just before the lockdown, we got a response back from Heritage Lottery Fund for new projects uh, and that is um, called setting the record straight and that is exactly about addressing um, gaps in the archive more head-on and finding better ways to engage more widely across communities um, at the heart of that is us hiring 10 we're calling them outreach champions but saying okay definitely be uh, bme and also lgbt narratives although we've got lots of them in the in the collection they're not being represented I think as well as they should be um, and in terms of submissions they're not necessarily 
have they haven't been as strong as other areas so the outreach champions is for us to make sure that we have a much more direct com uh, communication line with those communities to make sure that their stories are being represented and then what that, that when we open the museum they have a, a proper voice we're quite lucky in that because we're an emerging museum and because we're uh, you know we've got this collection but we, we're still starting from scratch in a way it gives us the ability to go what is missing what do we who do we need to champion who's not being championed and how can we best address those people and, and get them involved in the collection that is really direct and mean, really meaningful um so yeah but we're hoping that by the end of this project so by the end of this year um we'll have a collection that is way more diverse than it is now which will be really exciting Um, so do we have any, any more questions? I, just want, um, I was just going to ask about, um, about engaging a, a wide group of people in diversity. I think what, what we've noticed is that we've, we've done really well, especially in gaining followers on social media and just general engagement with our website and people reading blogs and things like that. Um, but it's hard. It, it's kind of noticeable that the people that don't engage with activities before lockdown are still not engaging with activities in uh, online. And, you know, there's lots of practical reasons for that, um, you know, and mental health um, issues, you know, is really, really difficult for a lot of people at the minute. People are on furlough. People just aren't motivated. People don't have access to the Internet and things like that. But I just wondered if anyone has got any strategies or things that they're planning i mean some of the things that we're going to be doing is um translating some of our material on our website into some community languages in the hope that that way we might be able to to engage some of the population there but it's interesting and sad that this, the groups that aren't represented or are, are don't engage as that hasn't really changed in the online world um one thing that we're doing um and we're, we're we're doing this as part of Brand 2020, but um, we are connecting with the food parcel networks. So we are currently sending a, a small zine to print that is about the project, about how you can get involved. It has activities in, it has a postcard in that people can post out for free. And that's going to go out to, I think, 600 households that um, the parcel, the food parcel network is supporting. And that, that's particularly working with um, uh, vulnerable adults uh, and, and, and kind of those groups that are most at risk at the moment. Um, but we're, we're, we're doing it in Brent at the moment, but we are having conversations with other partners across the UK. And I think that now, now that the system has been put in place where we've got, where there are those food parcel networks and they're generally those being run by either councils or with support of larger NGOs or organizations, they are now looking at how can we engage, um, how can we put other activities in there? So it's not just around food, but it's also around uh, creativity, activity, things to keep busy, resources. Um, so, you know, we, we're quite new to this. We're hopefully going to get it out next week in the parcels in Brent. But I think it is a really great way to reach people because they, those boxes, those parcels are meant for people that are most likely to either be at risk of not being reached by any other sources or might not have access to the internet uh, and need a more direct communication line yeah what I, am i yeah yeah um we're doing some uh work with uh schools project in in uh brixton through brixton project on um well the built environment in in brixton and we're planning some resources to go to uh primary school and also we're working with teenagers and this is something that is really quite tricky because obviously we don't know whether our kids will have access or they probably won't have access, all of them, to the internet. So we're planning on making actual education packs that can be sent out through the councils to the relevant classes. Because, I mean, that's the other thing is that we don't want to do all our teaching online anyway. I mean, they need, you know, children learn much better through doing rather than just looking at screens all the time so although our resources that we put up on MOLA they are um based you know you, they're, they're digital but they are very practical so hopefully you know kids will actually get away and 
and make something and do something rather than just be given a whole load more facts digitally but we're also aware that not every family has access to that so it's really important that that they can still um get to do creative activities and uh, yeah we're designing that at the moment do you want to add to that judy no i mean i yeah i exactly that's what i would have said <laughs> right. okay. we have someone who raised their hand so i'm going to check if it works for me to allow them to talk so rosamond if you have a question i'm allowing you to talk Hello there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi there. So, um, yeah, thanks for this um, amazing platform to hear all these speakers. It's it's really great that Layers of London has taken this kind of leading role in this because um, I first became aware of Layers of London through um, research we were doing for Newham Heritage Month, which was a live event based festival planned for May of this year. Um, so we had to do some very quick thinking to switch the festival, either deciding to postpone it or as we did decide to do to switch it into a, an online digital festival. So we had high aspirations to work with 30 community organisations to diversify the heritage offer and to reflect uh, Newham's um, Newham's community through those events and so a lot of the things that you've talked about uh, just in that latter question about uh, digital accessibility uh, have really raised their heads so we've had about six weeks of developing the material and we're just um, launching the website at the moment I've put the link in the comments bar um, at the side so you can have a look at where we've got to we put some VE day content up just to share our progress um, but we'll be launching the full festival in June um, <clears throat> if it's okay I just wanted to share a couple of observations that we found um, through uh, particularly about digital accessibility so the community groups that we have in Newham that we're working with, particularly um, around digital accessibility and disability arts, um, Together 21 is a fantastic example of this, um, working with artists who are um, who have who are consulting with with arts council and heritage fund about how to make their offers more accessible are crucially aware of how their users their the the people who belong to their group are unable to often access um mobiles computers um, often data is a problem uh, so we have an extra bit of our budget that we've put on one side to to facilitate people accessing um for example if someone needs to top up their data before accessing a zoom event that sort of thing so we've, we've kind of made that that side of the project available we're actually now as we're heading into a slightly different phase of lockdown and towards june we're looking at doing some limited print runs for a couple of the projects so that for example an event that was meant to be a home-based activity with children filling in um, uh, a worksheet about their reflections of what makes Newham home for them and what their relationship with their home is. And um, we're looking at printing a few of those and, and um, focusing on a few schools and a few food banks and uh, community hub um, centres to send out physical worksheets because of the amount of parents homeschooling. We think that there'll be quite good uptake on that. The kind of that's that's a sort of brief overview of a couple of kind of um, observations I had. I think the next step for us is to think about how we're evaluating all of this, how successful we've been and what the impact of, of um, lockdown has been on our project. Um, and I think now we're thinking about uh, what the digital accessibility is going to look like at the other end um, and then how that's going to impact on future funding opportunities as well for us for going forward um, and how we can develop the programme for the next year. But I think my, my general overview is that we will make some headway now working with communities who wouldn't previously have accessed heritage um, on a digital platform um by using uh slightly different platforms so obviously we know through digital marketing you know twitter instagram facebook we'd be using our website 
um, but we're we're looking more at using things like what WhatsApp and Nextdoor um, as platforms to reach different, more diverse, locally based communities in our borough, which is really exciting and, and great that we're kind of having a presence on those platforms with some positive activities at the moment. And it's not just whinging about rubbish being fly tipping on your street. You know, it's a it's a nice balance, I think. And we've had a really positive, positive um, uptake from that, a positive response so far from that. So that was it. Thank you, Rosamond. Uh, yeah, I think it's really encouraging to see like the work you're doing and the work that the projects we've heard from today are doing about um, thinking about the barriers that people face to accessing stuff online. A lot of times we see like university and school can all move online, but it's actually not as simple as that. And it's the same for projects like this. So I think it's really encouraging to see that everyone's uh, taking that into account. And does anyone else want to respond? I just wanted to say it's really nice to see so much exciting heritage stuff going on in Newham because I know that that you know it's like the only London borough that doesn't have a museum and the heritage offer has been a bit precarious in in uh, recent years so that's amazing to see so much going on there. Thank you thank you so much that's that's really welcome kind of encouragement at this stage because it has been a bit of a, a kind of crazy few months and even getting the project off the ground you know getting funding from you know with some we're a project of the borough but we're supported by heritage lottery fund and royal docks and you know just sometimes getting these projects off the ground feels like a task in itself and now delivering it is obviously <laughs> pretty epic as well so I, I appreciate that support it's um hopefully it'll come out with some good results at the other end please please do um watch the look at the website and follow us on social media any any support is gratefully received <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Miriam for uh, Fran. Uh, will the Conway Library images be freely accessible for all researchers and feel freely re reproducible for academic non-commercial publications? Will it be more integrated into the Courtauld collection as a whole when the gallery reopens in terms of displays for the public to see? Yeah, so um, the photographs are going to be completely free to use for non-commercial purposes for anyone. Um, remixing them, cropping them, doing whatever you want to them. There's some really nice examples on our blog, actually, where people have done really creative things. Um, as far as the actual physical photographs go, a big kind of driver of the digitization project is that at the moment, these photographs are taking up a lot of very expensive real estate um, in central London. So um, the actual boxes of photographs are going to go off to storage. Um, but because we'll have our website, which will be kind of fully searchable, and we're hoping that um, the buildings will be kind of geolocated as well, um, searchable by different kind of categories. Um, it means that you'll be able to kind of see really super high res um, images um, anywhere in the world. But if you really do need to look at a physical object, they're working out ways that you'll be able to kind of request it out of storage. Um, but um, what was the other bit of the question? Yeah, it's all going to be freely available, basically. Um, and at the moment, um, you know, the library like is still there. Um, so before lockdown, it is a kind of publicly open library. Um, and after lockdown, we hope that it will be kind of accessible again before all of the boxes go off site. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. We just have 10 minutes left. We'll try to get through all the questions we have. Um, from Adam, I think it's for everyone. Uh, the creativity you've shown in your projects is amazing. With an increase in online engagement, how do you think you'll maintain the balance between online and face-to-face -face engagement post-lockdown? Um, I was just going to say from our end, like for like, I'm, I touched upon it a little bit already, but uh, having this new, like having the lockdown has forced us to think of other ways and better ways in which we can engage with people that aren't just dependent on meeting people face-to-face. So I think what that will mean post lockdown is that when we do do our face to face engagements, they can have a um, much bigger remit and they can reach people that can't make it in different ways. And whether there's a way we can even have an online in person kind of combination of pulling things together where people can respond to an event as it is going on. But I think, you know, it's forcing a lot of people to think creatively, as you say. And I think that in the long run, that will only be beneficial in terms of uh, heritage organizations reaching more people. Yeah, I think similarly to what Lisa was saying, widening the remit is something that's happened 
um because suddenly when you go online like our project is quite a hyper local project we're in newington green so really our remit is newington green and then the widest it gets is the boroughs of hackney and islington and that's not a huge it's a, a huge amount of people but it's not a huge amount of space but then um suddenly when you're forced like with our school resources we were creating these packs to share um, with basically um, the children learn um, to write a protest poem based on our history of dissenting and the, the poets that we've had in our past. So um, they work to create these poems. But then suddenly when we were forced to go online, there's nothing to say that we can't upload this um, like on Times Educational Supplement and it be a national resource because you can learn about the history of the meeting house and the story of the dissenters if you're a school in Scunthorpe just as much as you can if you're a school in Hackney or Islington so actually what it did is widened our remit and it'd be interesting like we were talking earlier about evaluating how we you know um how many people actually do download that and engage with it but it means that we've had an opportunity to maybe do something that could get a national remit not just a quite a local one yeah I think similarly that we would say um with our projects that although although our education projects work probably best and will probably continue to work best face to face because a lot of it's very hands on that we might be able to i mean at the moment we're producing resources that can be used at home and that can be used online but also in the future possibly we might carry on with you know if we do a family workshop that we might produce resources which you know could could help people to carry on with that project and not just have the one off experience but to actually stay um linked up with us to to a certain extent so i think you know the fact that everybody's using all this technology and you know getting used to those ways of working will probably help help people to stay connected with with participants and um you know the people they want to engage with in the future yeah i think um for us we we're obviously that we don't know what's going to happen with how soon we'll be able to get back into the library and even if all of our volunteers might be able to join us we have quite a few people who you know are shielding and so they haven't been out of their house for a really long time and and they might not be able to come back when everybody else can um so we do want to kind of keep um a lot of our online activities going um so we have like twice a week um zoom chats where we give brief project updates but then it kind of just turns into people sharing recommendations and just catching up which is really lovely um so we don't think we'll be able to keep doing two a week but we'll do one a week um and then similarly with um a lot of the kind of research tasks and things those things still need to happen um mm. but the way that we used to run our digitization is that you would book shifts to come in and digitize so I think we'd still um, have all of that available for volunteers to kind of do when they're not on site. But then if people are on site, um, they need to be working with the photographs and, and kind of like getting through um, all of the millions of pictures um, that we need to digitize. So we're thinking about the ways that we can balance that. We're really excited um, about Zooniverse, which we haven't properly launched yet, but our volunteers are currently testing um because you know anyone in the world will then be able to help us add all of our really rich metadata which was something that we weren't planning to do before launching the proper website but like now it just seems like a really great opportunity to do so so mm -hmm. we're kind of feeling our way <laughs> um i mean loads of museums have used universe and there are some amazing projects on there so we're really hoping we can grab some momentum and you know do something I'm, really amazing i'm kind of hoping like fran this the remote volunteering takes off i mean i know um like layers of london have done lots of um i mean uh, obviously i know because i used to be the public engagement officer but yeah i mean you know remote learning was a, a, a and volunteering was a big part of that project and um i think that a lot of feedback from volunteering in the past when you try and set up things that are based online and remote I, or, or maybe it was just me personally, I always felt like there was something missing, that, that kind of social aspect. And a lot of people as volunteers kind of preferred going somewhere or being based in a space and getting that experience. Social is obviously a big thing, but I think people are starting to realise the benefits of remote volunteering. I mean, we've 
had um, quite, we've got quite a lot of digital volunteers, or, um, which was something we were going to do anyway, but we've got more recently because a lot of people are on furlough and very kindly um, are willing to use their skills in digital media and things like that to do some volunteering. So through that, we've got um, a lady called Emily who's helping do our social media. She runs social media for a big commercial architecture firm, but she's choosing to help us a couple of hours a week with our social media, which is great. And I'm really hoping that this kind of community activism and, and people helping out and I'm willing to do things online and will we'll keep going. I really hope that that's a positive that comes out of this. Absolutely, I think like just, I think we all have gotten so much more used to like talking to our computers while we're in our rooms by ourselves <laughs> uh, like this. So I think, uh, we can definitely take this forward and I think yeah it'll, like personally for like Layers of London it's given me lots of ideas about how we could approach uh, volunteering projects in a different way and probably in like a more dynamic way rather than just emailing uh, one person but like getting a team together and getting people to engage together online. So I think lessons to be learned uh, which I think we've heard a lot about today uh, I think we're all out of time now, but I just really want to thank uh, all our participants. Uh, it was great to hear from you, all the great projects you're working on. I hope uh, everyone will check out their websites and follow them on social media and sign up to mailing lists and stuff, because uh, I think there's a uh, lot of exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. And thank you for everyone who attended today. Uh, we're going to record, this has been recorded, uh, so we'll be putting it up on YouTube um if that's okay with our panelists um uh so if you want to share it with anyone else or watch it again or check out any of the slides that you saw uh, there'll be that opportunity uh so thank you very much everyone um and have a nice afternoon thank you thank you, thank you. bye bye, bye.